Well, uh, we will start it out, and I'll let Lieutenant Mark O'Brien uh, just give you the, the details, and then we'll take follow-up questions about the details of the event. Into the dates and times of what going to do. Yeah, this is the one where we tell them when it's occurring, just like the newspaper, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, this weekend we'll be having a check. We'll be having a DWI checkpoint. And uh, this is the press briefing for that. So I guess we'll go from there as to whatever question you questions you guys have on that. So is this a public part of it? Here? Is this a public meeting? And will you entertain questions from me and, and yes. talk to me about it? Yeah. I mean, I'm a law-abiding citizen that has concerns. Yeah. Um, James Miller of East Whitefield. Yep. When we get to that place, does it matter? That's fine. Um, um, I know that we all agree that we want zero drunk drivers on the road. So I have absolutely no issue with that. But I am concerned about sobriety checkpoints. And uh, first of all, I understand that they are they've been ruled to be constitutional and that, that you as Chief of Police in Whitefield are completely within your rights to exercise this. Um, some of the concerns I have are, are some confusion, at least uh, by me and perhaps some other people, about what their rights are at the checkpoint. And you recently made a statement at the county delegation meeting that, you know, you're here to protect people's rights. And I've got some questions I'd like to ask you specifically about what rights people have at the checkpoint. For example, um, are we, does the law require us to answer questions? It depends on what the question is. Um, you know, um, when we identify a person on a motor vehicle stop, um, you, you at least have to have an, enough of an exchange that you say who you are. You, I mean, you are, you are being stopped. So we need to know who you are and have a license and registration. Um, what you choose to engage in in conversation willingly after that is somewhat up to you. Um, you know, I mean, give me a scenario. I mean, you know, a, a typical motor vehicle stop, when you stop a car, there's an introduction, so to speak. You're told who the officer, you know, you're told the officer tells you what he's doing and then ask for a license and registration. Uh, that's, that's very basic. If you were stopped for speed, the officer would approach you, say why he stopped you, and then ask you for a license and registration, just to verify who you are. But beyond that, um, providing evidence of who you are, um, are you required to answer questions like, have you had anything to drink today? You don't have to. Um, I would say in most cases it's probably in your best interest. Um, you know, and, and I don't see the opposition to that. I don't see a rational opposition to that. For example, if you drove through the checkpoint and you, as you say, you are a law-abiding citizen, I take, you know, and you haven't been drinking, why would you, why would any person have an issue with saying, I haven't been drinking? I, I don't, that's, now. Well, I think it's more a, a matter of um, being able to exercise your right to not respond. Right. Since you haven't been accused of a crime, you haven't been told that you're under suspicion that you've committed a crime. Right. So, I guess the next question I would have is, um, does the law require you, let's, let's keep, you asked about a scenario, if, if I pull up to the stop and I have not been informed that I, uh, that there's suspicion I've committed a crime, or I've been accused of a crime, does the law require me to walk the line or touch my finger to my nose, or, or perform other uh, commands that the officer might get to me? No. Right. What, what you have to do is when you're having an exchange with an officer is you have to decide what's in your best interest. Now, if you're 
a person who drives up to the checkpoint and you decide that this is in your best interest, that's your choice. It may be very stupid, but it's your choice. On the other hand, if you decide, hi, officer, how you doing? Um, my name's John Smith. Here's my license registration. No, I haven't been drinking tonight. Um, how long is this going to take? Only a minute, Mr. Smith. Looks like you're okay. You're on your way in three minutes or less, usually averaging a minute and 20 seconds. If you want to sit there and do this, you can sit there and do that. Now, that's kind of playing games because if you haven't, you know, if you want to play a game and sit there like this and you haven't been drinking, well, what benefit other than a protest? What benefit is it of you to, to extend the time you're sitting there for the officer to try to, has this guy been drinking or has he not been drinking or is he doing this because he's been drinking and he's trying to hide it? See, the officer has a, has a job and he's going to make a decision relatively quick. And most people that travel through there have not been drinking. Okay, so for the, all the people who have not been drinking, you want to get them out of there as soon as you can. So you want to say, hello, Mr. Smith would conduct a field sobriety check. You've been stopped. Um, we're seeing if people are on the road drinking and driving and seeing if they're dangerous and maybe going to kill somebody. And it's our job to take those people off the road. Have you been drinking tonight? Well, you can do that. But as a citizen who wants to protect other people who you live with in the community, is that responsible? And I would suggest no. I would suggest not drinking, driving up the road, and answering questions very quickly and getting back on the road is responsible. I would suggest the other stuff. Maybe it's within your right, but I would also suggest you border and on childish. If you haven't been drinking, just say, I haven't been drinking. They'll agree with you most likely because you haven't been, and you're gone. If you want to sit there, not answer questions, you can. It's going to keep you there a little longer so the officer feels safe about whether you're okay or not. He's got to have a good feeling that you're ready to drive down the road because his obligation is, I can't let you drive down the road if I don't think you're safe. I mean, that would be crazy for him to say, you know, so. So that's only going to extend your stop. It's going to extend your own stop for no reason just to be, just to do it. And you can do it if you want. There's no law saying that you can't s sit there with the arms crossed. Do I suggest that that's what you do at a stop when a police officer stops you? No. And I would say that 99% of people are reasonable people and understand what you're doing. So when the officer asks them a pretty simple question like, have you been drinking? They say, no. Okay. Now, if it turns out they actually have been drinking, this is where the issue comes in. If I've been drinking, should I answer questions and incriminate myself? Well, there's really no difference between whether you stop for speed on Meadow Street and you get asked the same question, or whether you were stopped in the DWI checkpoint and asked the same question. Because if we both agree that we legally can stop you, then the question we ask you, whether it be on Meadow Street after a speed stop or whether it be at the checkpoint after a checkpoint stop, it's the same burden. We've made the stop. Now we have to check the occupants in the car and, and make sure that from that scenario, from the time that the stop is over and the time that they go back on the road, that's your obligation to know that these people can travel on the road safely. So... Now we're into the person who actually has been drinking. So you drive up to the checkpoint, um, and you haven't, this is one where you haven't turned around, you're going through the checkpoint, and you, and you are one of the ones that are randomly picked and you pulled over and you have been drinking. So the next question is, do I respond to the officer, or do I remain silent? Do I tell the truth? 
or do I lie? Do I participate or do I not participate? That's not much different than oftentimes we run into when we stop a, a car for just random patrol. And to, to back that up, if we stop a car getting away from checkpoint or checkpoint either way, and the officer goes to the driver and, and asks the driver for identification, which is common practice, um, tells him who he is, why he stopped him, I stopped you either for checkpoint or I stopped you for speed or whatever I stopped you for. There's a reason for the stop. In this stop, the reason for the stop is a checkpoint. Um, and then his job is to notice things that are out of the ordinary. So on the typical stop, if he says, as he's having that exchange with the person and he, and he notices, for example, which is very common, an odor of alcohol coming. And you and your life experience or any, any people watching this may be familiar with what a person who's been drinking smells like. Well, so is the officer. They've been, not only are they familiar with it because they've lived, but they have also been trained in it and dealt with people who've been drinking. So now the officer is hit with, I'm smelling alcohol. So a reasonable question for the officer would be, have you been drinking? The person in the car has all kinds of choices. They can do this, which sometimes they do. They can say, yeah, I've only had one, which sometimes is true. They can say, yeah, I've had 17. I had a person tell me once they had 17. Um, and when we counted the, the remaining ones out of the 30 pack, he was right. Um, so the response that people take is up to them. But it's prudent for an officer to ask them the question because his job is to find out information. So now, in the event the officer has a reason to believe a person has been drinking, and he wants to verify whether that person is safe to drive on the road, now we've gone past the, this is the people who have been drinking. And there's some indication that maybe his motor skills are not quite that, that they should be. For example, he's grabbing the license and he drops it or he's slurring his words, or his eyes are bloodshot, or he's not sure where he's coming from, or you know his clothes are wet in front, or his pants fly is, is undone. All these different things that are kind of common to do. Oh, God, you get any combination of those things. And the officer says in his mind, this person may be impaired, impaired too much to drive safely. So it's prudent for then the officer to take the next step and say, let's see if this person is impaired to drive, and I'll ask them if they'll take some field sobriety tests, because it's the best way to find out if they are impaired. So the officer will say, sir, would you mind stepping out of the car and taking field sobriety tests? Now, we've had several instances where people have said, no, I won't. They can. That's, they have to make a choice for what they think is the right thing to do. Most people will step out because actually most people want to participate with it and say, well, I will step out. I'll, I'll do what the office is requesting. And, and a lot of people also step out because they think they'll do okay on it. But... Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So the next step is the, the person steps out, and then we have a very specific criteria for looking at and trying to evaluate whether the person's safe to drive it on. It's a standardized field sobriety testing. So you start with the initial stop. You start with a cursory investigation. You know, do I see anything? Has the person admitted to drinking? Yes, no. Most of them haven't, and they go on. Then for the ones who have been, there's some indication they've been drinking, well, it's your duty to find out whether they're safe or not to proceed. They step out of there. Now you have to make a judgment call. I'm going to have you perform these series of tests, and I have to make a judgment. Are you too drunk to, to drive, or am I okay with you going back in the, in the car and leaving? Um, and that's how it works.